Okay, hi everybody. Um, welcome to the informatics seminar. Um, today we have Tawana Dillahelt, who's an assistant professor um, at the University of Michigan School of Information. Uh, she also holds a courtesy appointment in electrical engineering and computer science. Uh, she leads the Social Innovations Group, an interdisciplinary group of individuals whose vision is to design, build, and enhance technologies to solve real-world problems affecting marginalized groups and individuals primarily in the U.S. Uh, she holds an MS and PhD in human-computer interaction from CMU, uh, an MS in computer science from Oregon Health and Science University, and a BS for, in computer engineering from North Carolina State. Um, she was also a software engineer at Intel for seven years, and she'll be presenting on designing and envisioning digital tools for low-resource job seekers. Uh, please join me in welcoming <coughs> Dr. Doha. Right, thanks for the introduction, and, and thanks everyone for, for coming. It's, it's great to be here. It's great weather. Everyone's saying it's raining, but I, I didn't notice. <laughs> Um, so I'm excited to present work uh, that my group has done around uh, designing and envisioning digital tools for low resource job seekers. Uh, this is work that's been conducted for the uh, past five years, um, primarily across uh, uh, around job seekers, but then our latest research looks at external stakeholders like career counselors so that we can get a more comprehensive uh, view. So when I say low resource job seekers, I mean uh, job seekers from uh, who have less than a college education, uh, they often come from uh, low-income uh, uh, areas, and um, what we're finding in our work is they often have uh, limited digital skills. Um, so I'm just also going to warn you that I am a little tired. I'm still suffering from jet lag, and my mom forgot that I was uh, on the West Coast, so she called me at 3.30 this morning, <laughs> and I didn't get a chance to go back to sleep. So, um, so I'm going to start off by uh, motivating the work um, with uh, a framework that we use uh, to help um, frame our findings. Uh, the framework is employability, which consists of uh, three dimensions, um, social capital, social and human capital, career identity, and personal adaptability. And employability is a key contributor to one's success. Um, so I'm going to go through each of these dimensions um, just so that we all have context. Um, so social capital is uh, what many of us use to, to find employment, to find jobs. Uh, these are the inherent benefits that we gain from our social networks. Uh, human capital has to do with um, our, you know, the knowledge uh, that we obtain through uh, education uh, or just general experience. Um, so there are many uh, factors of human capital. Of those, education and experience have been found to be the strongest predictors of career progression. And career identity really relates to one's career experiences and aspirations, and it addresses the question of who am I or who do I want to be? Um, it can be expressed in the form of stories or narratives and is inherently longitudinal. Uh, it requires making sense of your past and present and giving direction to your future. Whereas career identity answers the question of who am I or who do I want to be, uh, personal adaptability provides the answer to how do I go about getting there. And personal adaptability allows us to um, adapt to the changing demands of the work environment. And individuals who embody personal adaptability have a high propensity to learn, and they're open to changing environments. So we can take, for example, um, people who are working part-time, uh, maybe taking some of your online courses or taking some of the massive open online courses um, so that they can um, get ahead or, or uh, transition to, to new fields in some cases. Um, so in essence, employability is maximized uh, when there is strength in all three of these dimensions. And so my research investigates how technology supports employability, particularly among low resource job seekers. And so I've investigated opportunities for new and existing digital applications to support uh, employability. Um, people nearby applications, which are applications that help people um, uh, find offline uh, connections. These are often called, uh, some people refer to them as dating apps, but, um, or location-based applications. So we've really explored how uh, newcomers, in some cases, go to these uh, platforms to meet people offline, offline and exchange forms of, uh, of capital. Um, and then uh, I've also uh, um, yeah, studied this in the context of real-time ride-sharing systems and in massive open online courses. Um, so today I'm going to talk specifically about how digital employment tools do, don't, and could support employability. And so the ubiquity of disruptive technologies such as robotics, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things have really changed the nature of work and continues to do so. So maintaining employability in this environment is crucial. 
However, there have been a vast number of tools and technologies that actually provide this type of support. Uh, so we have sites like LinkedIn, which can help us to connect to individuals. We have Coursera, these massive open online courses that can help us uh, to acquire uh, human capital. Uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a platform that provides us uh, with employment opportunities. Uh, sites like Upwork. And so these sites do provide us with access to human and social capital, um, career identity by exposing job seekers to new fields, and also personal adaptability by allowing job seekers to work in and explore new fields. And so a 2015 Pew report found that 34% of recent job seekers say that online resources were the most important source of support in their most recent job search. And this is key because this is more than connections with close friends and family. So the researcher, you know, Grana Vetter's you know, uh, research talks about how social networks are, are really important to finding jobs, but this report uh, finds that you know, a lot of job seekers are, are going online. Um, however, what we're finding is that those with limited socioeconomic resources are less likely to benefit from these digital resources. So the figure that you see here shows the proportion of recent job seekers who stated that they were not confident in their ability to perform these six related uh, job tasks online. And you can see there's an extreme spike for those who haven't attended college. So examples of these job search related tasks include contacting potential employers through email, uh, filling out job applications online. And so while the internet is a valuable resource in the job search, it's still not clear how low resource populations are actually benefiting from it. And so um, the nature of work has changed and is changing and we see a number of tools available to support employability for workers. However, we must ensure that low resource job seekers aren't being left behind. And this is one of the key motivations for my research. Um, again, my team and I have investigated how digital tools and technologies could lead to employment, particularly among low resource job seekers or those with limited education, digital skills, and income. And so I've framed today's presentation around addressing the three, the following three research, or following four research questions. Uh, first, what are the strategies for and barriers to getting ahead for these job seekers? Second, in what ways do and can employment tools already support job seekers? Third, what are the perspectives of external stakeholders such as career counselors and business managers? And how do these perspectives compare to those of job seekers? And then finally, how can employment tools be improved to support all stakeholders? So we've conducted several studies for the past five years with over 130 uh, individuals consisting primarily of low resource job seekers and those who serve them. And I have to say that my students are hard working, uh, reaching out to more job seekers. We've probably reached out to over 200 at this point because um, we have a partnership with a local um, unemployment center. And so our research has been conducted in southeastern Michigan and primarily Detroit. Uh, the demographics of our uh, job seekers are representative of uh, the Detroit area, which is shown here, where almost 80% of the population is black, 10% white, and 7% Hispanic. The poverty rate of the area is 35.7%, and the median uh, household is uh, the median yeah median household income is less than 30,000. So while 79% of the population have a high school degree or higher, only 13.8% have a bachelor's degree or higher. And so Detroit's unemployment rate stood at 7.4% in April of 2018. Um, this is well above Michi the Michigan's uh, unemployment rate of 4.7%. And this doesn't include those who are marginally attached. And so um, it would, the, the unemployment rate or the rate would be higher if it did include those who are um, marginally attached, which includes discouraged wor workers and also part-time workers. So we refer to job seekers who've been looking for a job in the last six months as opposed to the last month as calculated in the traditional unemployment rate. Uh, we also focused on job seekers who had a median income of less than $35,000 a year and who had less than a four-year degree. Uh, we've used a wide range of recruiting techniques uh, across our studies. Uh, we've purchased addresses based on zip codes. We've advertised via snail mail. Um, we've recruited through our community partners. Um, and we've also posted flyers in popular areas in the community such as grocery stores, hair salons, barbershops, bus stops, and laundromats. And we've also recruited through sites like Craigslist. So I'll present several studies that consist of user-centered design approaches, such as interviews and surveys, design sessions, need validation, and speed dating, and pilot uh, deployments and evaluation of our tools. Uh, the vast majority of our research has focused on the perspective of job seekers, 
And again, our most recent work investigates the perspectives of these external stakeholders, like career counselors, just so we can have a more comprehensive understanding of employability among our population. So we first started out by asking the research question, what are the strategies that people are already using to get ahead, and what are some of the barriers that they face in doing so? We conducted interviews in the summer of 2013 to answer this question. And so we conducted a mixed methods exploratory study consisting of in-depth interviews, participant surveys, and a design scenario exercise. We had a total of 36 participants across all sessions. And so we first conducted 25 in-depth interviews. The goal of the interviews was to understand the strategies for and barriers to getting ahead in terms of economic growth. And we then gave each interviewee a 20 to 30 minute survey, which was a community and technology assessment. Um, I analyzed the interview results to derive five specific scenarios that were representative of the types of barriers that our job seekers faced. And then I also captured aspects of social capital and resources that the population's access to get ahead. For example, many people use libraries and public assistance programs. So we had a scenario-based design session to understand how groups use their social capital and resources to work through the barriers that were presented um, in each of our scenarios. So this is an example of one of our five scenarios. Again, um, the situations presented in the scenarios represent the types of barriers our participants faced. So here we have Sharon. Um, she's a McDonald's cashier whose goal is to get an education. She graduated from high school 15 years ago and she was told that education is key and it's the path to a good, stable career. However, she took out a loan for her mother which her mother never paid back. Now she can't secure a loan because of her credit, and she wants to get back to school, but she's not sure if she should pursue an associate's degree or bachelor's degree. And she's you know, really uncertain about her future, and she doubts her ability to achieve her goal. So here you can see that we had four groups in our study. We gave each group a digital recorder, and we recorded all conversations and had our sessions transcribed. We designated roles for each group member in our scenario-based design session. So it's really important to include roles in such sessions just so people can uh, remain engaged. So we had a designated resource person who was responsible for capturing internal and external resources used. The troubleshooter who was charged with identifying potential barriers to reaching solutions to problems. And we had a scribe who was responsible for noting answers to preset questions and reporting out to the rest of the team. The goal of the scribe was to take notes and answer questions such as, what resources should Sharon use you know, to, go, to go to school? What resources are available to her? Where should she look for these resources? And who should she go to? Uh, who does she contact to learn about opportunities? And how does she figure out which degree to pursue? So again, this is one example of scenarios. We had additional scenarios that groups had to work through. And so to highlight some of our findings, we saw that strategies to get ahead included getting an education, uh, which we already learned in our interviews and surveys. Our scenario design sessions provided us with examples of how participants felt the need to access support for such resources outside of the city. So people were in Detroit, but they felt that Detroit lacked the resources, so they needed to go outside to, to get these resources. We also saw through the sessions that having access to strong networks was key and that this happened serendipitously. In other words, people didn't intentionally go out and network. They felt that these things just happened by chance. So someone they knew, you know, reached out to, reached out to them and said, oh, you should contact this person. Or they happened to be on the bus and the person sitting next to them was going through the same thing that they were going through. So these things were serendipitous. Um, our participants also stated that connections differ and that it's critical to have the right <coughs> connections. So having the right connections was a way to get ahead and not having them was seen as a barrier. So one of our participants described getting the hookup. For example, if you're real cool with your counselor, they'll send you an email letting you know when the funding is coming back in. Another participant expressed the challenge of getting the, the right information and finding the right person. So people will tell you these things. You have to have to know or you have to have a worker that's that good that she's going to tell you. So in terms of challenges and barriers to getting ahead, neighborhood transiency led to neighborhood instability and thus community distrust. This was the case in both our interviews and our surveys. And there were challenges regarding poor school and college preparation. Uh, some felt that limited work was available and that having a police record uh, posed extreme challenges. Um, but the key takeaway here is the importance of social capital 
has a strategy and a barrier. So overall, employment barriers included limited access. This included limited access to social and human capital, job search feedback, and transportation. Transportation was a significant barrier to getting ahead, often leading to individuals not making it to interviews, job fairs, or to career services centers. Success strategies included networking and mentorship to navigate the resources available, as well as to obtain education and training for jobs. And I'll add that I'm throwing in the word networking. This isn't what they, this isn't the term that they used. Um, as a parent in our scenario with Sharon, our participants lack career identity and personal adaptability, but they were well aware of the benefits of social capital and human capital. So the key takeaway here is that social capital is incredibly important. When you have strong access to uh, social networks, the connections could lead to transportation to work, to job search feedback, and information about where to find inexpensive training. And to really drive this point home, I'd like to take an example from recent work that was conducted by one of my PhD students. So in a semi set of semi-structured interviews with low-resource job seekers, my student found that even job seekers with major barriers succeed with social support. So we have Luke, who is a landscaper with his boss, but for much of the year, because we're in Michigan, <laughs> landscapers only work, you know, a certain time of the year, um, he didn't have steady business. So Luke says, I met my new employer through my boss. He's my boss's best friend. When we had downtime on our company, my boss refers me to whoever. Like I said, I do everything. Everybody tries to keep me busy because I've been homeless. I'm still kind of homeless. And Luke had a variety of barriers. He was uh, epileptic. He was a prior felon and semi-homeless yet he was still able to consistently find work through his social connections. So to begin to answer the second research question, in what ways do and can employment tools address these barriers? We use methods that were inspired by participatory design. So we conducted a three-step design activity with 20 individuals. We gave participants surveys at the start of our workshop and then had a learning and design activity. The workshop lasted about three hours and each participant was compensated $30 for their time. So the goal of the session was to answer two questions. Are sharing economy applications feasible for our target population? And could sharing economy applications meet the needs, meet the employment needs of our target population? And we explicitly asked our participants to design a system to meet their employment needs if the sharing economy applications that were presented didn't address them. So you can read the paper for details, but the four, um, the four uh, applications we presented were Lyft, Airbnb, TaskRabbit, and Neighbor Goods. So why do we consider the sharing economy? Well, these systems provide uh, financial opportunities in some cases. They offer employment opportunities and a way to build job skills. You often save money by way of sharing, and there are opportunities to foster social capital through these serendipitous connections. So again, I encourage you to read the paper for details, but we found that there was some promise for the sharing economy. Uh, there was general trust between strangers, there was idling capacity, which means that people had um, extra seats in their car, for example, or they actually had resources to, to share. Um, and people in general had a general belief in the commons. Uh, however, there must be critical mass, so there must be enough people to participate in these services. Um, as, as well as the facilitation of safe financial transactions. So people were uh, hesitant about providing uh, credit card information uh, in these systems. Uh, they also wanted clear transparency around how these systems worked, and particularly around how the ranking and rating systems work. So they would see how people were being ranked, and they would question who it was that was ranking the drivers, for example, or rank ranking the workers. So re recall that we explicitly asked our job seekers, if you could talk to developers of certain applications of the sharing economy, what would you tell them to, to design or build or create for you based on your current employment situation? And uh, this participant here kind of sums up what we heard from a lot of other participants. You know, he says, an app that can kind of do pre-testing and that can help you with your confidence level, your skill level, interviewing process, something job related, like writing and preparing resumes most commonly asked questions and how to interview. And so we took the barriers and potential solutions from our formative work to create a set of design concepts, which we tested among low resource job seekers. Note that we're still trying to address our second research question. And so to generate these concepts, we drew from ACI literature to understand what tools had already been developed and to understand whether there were additional hardships among job seekers. 
Upon generating these concepts, we conducted a speed dating study to assess and rank the value of 10 different digital tools. So our goal was to get a sense really of, of how our participants prioritize these tools. So speed dating, and if those of you haven't heard of this method, it's kind of like speed dating you know, for, for partners. Uh, you're speed dating for concepts. You're trying to quickly understand you know, people's feedback on a, on a set of concepts. What, are, you know, what works, what doesn't work, but then how do they, they prioritize these concepts? And so a review of ACI research in the space identified additional job seeker barriers such as low wages and homelessness. And from this review, we categorized the challenges as personal, social, and societal. Our literature review highlighted additional barriers such as career identity among homeless populations and job availability. Uh, this is work that's, that was done by uh, David Hendry and others. And Hendry and even our own past work reinforced the need for social connections. And uh, Lynn Dombrowski's research highlighted the need for societal level issues such as support for wage theft, and employee rights. The lack of transportation infrastructure is also a societal issue. And so just to give you a quick overview of some of the tools that we developed uh, for personal, we included a concept uh, that we call Skills Identifier, which is shown here. And so Skills Identifier is a tool that helps job seekers identify and communicate their job skills. So our storyboards look like this and included simple scenarios that represented, again, scenarios from past ACI literature and our own past work. So here we have Andy who wants to work in a customer service related job, but he's not sure how his previous experiences are related to these positions. He learns about Skills Identifier and enters that he's a construction worker who wants to go into customer service. Skills Identifier shows, Joe, shows Andy the common skills between construction work and, cus and customer service. For example, problem solving and teamwork skills, which he then highlights in his resume. We also included a concept called Review Me which is a tool that enabled job seekers to receive resume feedback. Note that this tool was both personal and social because it essentially connected job seekers to volunteers who could review their resumes. Finally, we included tools that address societal issues such as the lack of transportation. I'm not gonna go into detail here due to time, so you please refer to our paper. So the key takeaway from this work is that we found that our job seekers prefer those tools that address their personal and most immediate needs. For example, everyone needed support in terms of getting feedback on their resumes or creating their resumes. There are also job seekers who were looking for volunteer and community work um, uh, and, and needed resources to address uh, issues such as gaps in their resumes. Interestingly, the social applications that we had in our, in our concepts uh, were ranked among the lowest concepts because job seekers were aware that they didn't have many people to, to vouch for them. So the top rated concept from this study was an application that we call Review Me, which heavily drew on the results of our earlier studies. And so we leveraged the results of our speed dating study, and we're still again trying to address our second research question, how can employment tools address the barriers faced by job seekers, such as the lack of employment feedback and access to social ties. But in this case, we designed, implemented, deployed, and evaluated our own tool, uh, Review Me. So Review Me is a tool for job seekers and volunteers. It allows job seekers to upload their resumes and to receive feedback from the volunteers. So if you're a user in the system, you can log in as a job seeker or volunteer and either seek resume feedback or provide resume feedback. So the purpose of this tool, again, is to begin addressing the feedback from the last, service, last study presented, but also to serve as a conduit to networks or people who could provide job seekers with employment feedback. And so going back to the employability framework, the tool we described really supports social capital. So again, serving as a conduit between individuals and their social networks. Um, we wanted to understand the strengths and limitations of our tool and under what factors these limitations existed. And we wanted to identify a set of general UX principles that best supported these strengths and limitations. So I'm going to describe our design, our implementation, uh, and pilot deployment of the tool. And then I'll discuss the limitations uh, in our deployment. So what do we do? We followed a UCD process that consisted of conducting background research to understand the additional stakeholders who were involved in the employment process. We then conducted surveys, contextual inquiries with an early version of our application, and then interviews with our targeted job seekers. We also interviewed an HR specialist who had experience working with low-resource job seekers and also ex-felon. 
Finally, we implemented our prototype and made several iterations over our concepts based on the results of these initial investigations. We deployed our application, and then I'm going to provide details of the deployment later. So we observed the use of our application through logs and in person, and then we reached out to those who used the tool after four months for an initial evaluation. And so to evaluate our pilot, we sent out an email to over 300 students first, <laughs> inviting them to participate as volunteers. Um, we told them that they could sign up as job seekers if they wanted to, but we were really trying to, to bring in volunteers. Um, we also purchased LinkedIn and Facebook ads. We then recruited offline from local career centers and public libraries. After we recruited, we sent out surveys to those who registered and we invited them to interview about their experience using our site. So what did we find? Well, the feedback from students was, was relatively positive. Mm -hmm. um, overall, students liked the anonymity of receiving feedback. Um, the perception was that the feedback was more honest. Um, they, 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 they felt like their friends uh, didn't disclose their full, their full thoughts because they were afraid of hurting their feelings. Um, so they liked this aspect of anonymity. Um, and while students preferred expert reviewers, they really weren't able to gauge the level of expertise of, of those who were uh, reviewing them. So on the other hand, there were resumes from certain fields that remained untouched, and there was slow response times to, to getting feedback in some <coughs> cases. So now I want to see how, you know, I wanted to see how our student findings compared to those of our targeted job seekers. Um, so first, uh, there was limited access uh, and digital literacy among our participants. Uh, most of them commented that they didn't have access to digital resumes. Um, many job seekers from our target population saved their resumes on public computers, which were removed um, you know, every now and then. And so they lost them due to system upgrades and, and various other maintenance um, situations. Uh, others stored their, their resumes on USB flash drives, but these devices had been lost or stolen. And then some individuals had physical copies of their resumes at home. Um, and I can talk about that later. Um, so our registration process required users to confirm their email addresses. And we saw that job seekers searched for their email addresses and upon finding them, couldn't remember their passwords. So many used text-based password retrieval to log into their accounts. Finally, our application only accepted PDFs. And one, at least one participant uh, didn't understand how to convert his Word document to a PDF. And so we sat with him to walk him through this process. But, you know, again, we're not really capturing those who struggled in, in this process or who might have quit because they couldn't figure this out. And so I think what's most alarming about these findings is that these same population segments are likely unable to submit basic employment applications or file for unemployment uh, without significant handholding. Uh, these populations likely face other barriers such as signing up for health care or conducting searches for inexpensive housing. And so we consider and contributed the following design principles as a start to address some of the issues we encountered in our deployment. Uh, so we um, contribute compatibility, practicality, direct support and familiarity and accessibility. So compatibility, uh, many job seekers, again, didn't have digital copies of their resume, though several had physical copies. And so for compatibility, we propose allowing job seekers to upload a photograph image of their resume um, as smartphones with cameras were pervasive among our job seekers. Uh, practicality, some job seekers had a limited understanding of how to keep track of digital files. Um, they didn't understand that you know, they could email it to themselves and kind of have it you know, forever. Um, job seekers kept digital copies of their resumes on thumb drives, but these devices were either lost or stolen. And so we proposed ways to accept resumes offline, uh, maybe through a kiosk uh, of some sort for convenience. Mm -hmm. Direct support. Uh, some patrons simply required hand-holding. Um, we said built-in chat support with experts, but I think having someone <coughs> physically there to uh, support job seekers uh, is, is required. And then finally, familiarity accessibility. So we did follow a standard interface for user registration, uh, but individuals forgot their passwords uh, to their email accounts. So we ex suggest allowing participants to register with familiar accounts, such as Facebook and Instagram, but also through SMS verification or with two-step ver verification phone prompts. So overall, our tool worked great for our students, uh, but failed miserably among low-resource job seekers, primarily due to issues of low digital literacy. And overall, low digital literacy is a significant barrier to employment for our targeted job seekers, and these job seekers will continue to be left behind without substantial change. 
So in this work, we contributed ReviewMe, which is a digital employment tool um, inspired by participatory and user-centered design techniques. Uh, the tool aims to address the social network gaps that exist in the employment process, and particularly among our target populations. We extend past employment research that aims to address the employment needs among low resource job seekers. So the system as implemented in 2015 had limitations. Uh, we recruited volunteers who provided feedback free of charge, which is not sustainable over the long run. Um, currently, we have an automated uh, resume feedback uh, using uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. And we've begun to adhere to our own design principles. Uh, for example, we're allowing uh, people to um, provide uh, image, uh, images of their resumes. Um, and then we began to conduct a wider scale deployment across a local career center, so with our uh, partners. Um, and then we've explored and have deployed an interview feedback tool, uh, extending some of the work done by uh, Jillian Hayes and others. So our solutions providing, providing information access in a way uh, social capital to job seekers was to involve employment sites and to bring in the perspective of external stakeholders such as career counselors and business managers. So therefore our next step was to understand their perspectives and our goal again was to obtain a more comprehensive understanding of the job search process for our targeted job seekers. And so we've conducted 23 interviews with career advisors, business service coordinators, and one employer. So it's a challenge to bring in employers in our um, process. Uh, career advisors or career counselors are those who help job seekers find employment. Business service representatives are those who work directly with company recruiters and representatives for human re or from human resources. And then, of course, the employers are those who are hiring uh, job seekers. Uh, these interviews provide an insight into how these groups work together to match job seekers with employment opportunities, and then what are some of the pain points uh, in this process. And so our initial revo results reveal that tra transportation remains an open challenge among low resource job seekers. And I'll talk about that later because it's a big issue. Um, but we do see opportunities uh, for digital tools to support human capital, career identity, and personal adaptability. So social capital um, wasn't a salient finding because we believe that the external stakeholders are filling this gap. Um, unfortunately, we don't have enough data from employers to put together a complete picture uh, from the perspective of these external stakeholders. Um, but in the next slides, I provide quotes uh, from our stakeholders to demonstrate our finding. So over half of our career advisors and business service reps talked about the importance of having soft skills. So in the current job market, employers are willing to train job seekers on how to do the hard skills. As one career advisor stated, I think the number one thing is learning how to articulate the skills that they, the job seekers, have, and to match those soft skills to relatable words. This is one of the biggest struggles that we have. Because if you can do that, you can write your resume, you can write your cover letter, and that leads into everything else, which corresponds to our prior findings as well. So in some cases, job seekers weren't able to write their resume, so this was a challenge. Recall that job seekers spoke broadly about the need for education and training, but not soft skills specifically. As a reminder, career identity relates to one's career experiences and aspirations, and it addresses the question of who am I, or who do I want to be? Career identity could be expressed in the form of stories or narratives. And one career advisor explained that there aren't tools available to support this dimension of employability. He says, I don't try to come up with job titles for them. It's really based on what they say. We don't have the tools for us to sit down and say, oh, you sound like you'd be a marketing engineer or whatever. That kind of goes a little beyond our scope. So another career advisor stressed the longitudinal nature of career identity. He said, Long-term employment comes from not only meeting your basic needs, but also fulfilling, feeling fulfilled in what you do. So really, getting to know someone helps to figure out what opportunities would be best for them. What's interesting is that career identity was not a barrier or strategy identified by our job seekers. And so personal adaptability allows one to adapt to the changing demands of the work environment and the job market. This was another dimension that was salient among career advisors, but hadn't been mentioned previously by our job seekers. Here, the career advisor calls out how job seekers aren't quite sure how or what steps uh, to take to reach their career identity. So he says, because everybody get caught up, I wanna be a nurse, I wanna be a doctor, I wanna be this and that. But when you ask them all, but where do you see yourself five years from now? I don't know. So now that we've heard the perspectives of external stakeholders such as career counselors and business managers, I'd like to compare these perspectives to our job seekers. 
So first and foremost, in terms of challenges, limited access to transportation is a severe barrier for our job seekers. Low digital literacy is also a significant barrier that we identified in our deployment of our Review Me tool, um, but you know, we, we didn't necessarily um, uh, find this you know, among our um, stakeholders because in a way they might be bridging this gap, they might be filling this gap in low digital literacy. We also found in my PhD student study that digital tools such as Indeed were excellent for finding jobs, but not for landing them, which might provide job seekers with false hope. Validating the need for social resources, uh, those job seekers who were successful in landing jobs were those who had access to strong social ties through job referrals. And for external stakeholders, transportation again showed up as a key barrier. Social capital and low digital literacy was a challenge among job seekers, again, that wasn't mentioned among these external stakeholders. But in terms of keys to success, again, job seekers saw social capital, and both job seekers and external stakeholders mentioned human capital, though job seekers were focused on the hard skills, and the external stakeholders felt that soft skills were key. Finally, personal adaptability wasn't mentioned from the perspective of job seekers, though it's a success factor that was mentioned among our external stakeholders. So we see this as an open opportunity <coughs> to support both parties. And so the last step in our work has been to understand how employment tools can be improved to support all stakeholders. And we aim to do this through a tool that we call Dream Gigs. So if you all went to Kai, some of you might have seen this presentation, well, seen part of this. So Dream Gigs is a tool to help job seekers understand what career-related skills they need to reach their ideal or their dream job. Our goal for Dream Gigs is again to support all dimensions of employability and then to consider bringing in all stakeholders. And I'll discuss how we um, uh, tackle these uh, employability dimensions by providing a walkthrough of the tool. So first, this tool allows users to provide their current or most recent job. So let's say construction laborers. Users then enter their dream job or the job they'd like to obtain. So let's say accountants. Finally, participants enter their geographic location, so we enter Detroit. This step requires one to consider, who do you want to be? And we then tap into the Data at Work API, which I can discuss later if you have questions, but the API allows us to obtain the skills that a construction laborer has and the skills that an accountant needs. We subtract the current skills from the needed skills, which you see here. So users can then select the skills they wish to acquire, here, users could select economics and accounting and mathematical reasoning. Because the step provides the skills needed to reach the selected dr dream job, we categorize it as human capital. We then take the skills economics and accounting and written comparable economics and accounting and mathematical reasoning and input each back into the Data at Work API. This provides us with a list of jobs that job seekers could do to obtain those skills, which is what you see here. So you can think of this as the skills acquisition step. So users can see a list of related jobs that they could do. We also allow users to select one related occupation to see the jobs in their area. For example, someone could select correspondence clerks. And recall that personal adaptability allows one to adapt to the changing demands of the work environment and the job market. So this list of related jobs shows job seekers which jobs they could consider to reach their dream job. Finally, after selecting one of the related jobs, users are able to see if this job or related jobs are available in their area. So here we're pulling jobs uh, through Indeed. We've also considered pulling from Craigslist and other job sites, but we didn't have uh, good luck with those. Those jobs aren't, aren't reliable. Um, we've also uh, have access to an API that would enable us to show relevant classes. So you can imagine pulling uh, courses from massive open online courses, uh, for example. But for our job seekers, we've been prioritizing opportunities to bring them face to face with other individuals to build social and human capital. So we've begun to tap into volunteermatch.com to connect job seekers to offline volunteer opportunities. Now some of you might be wondering, well you mentioned that digital literacy is a significant barrier. Why are you proposing this tool? Well first, there wasn't a login screen, there's nothing that needs to be uploaded, so job seekers can use this as a fully informational tool. And our goal is to make the tool as inclusive as possible. Uh, we adopted the Ionic 3 framework, which is built on top of Angular framework to create a hybrid application. So this allows the tool to, act, to be accessible across multiple platforms and multiple uh, mobile devices. So we're also investigating ways to provide direct support 
by designing this tool for intermediaries like career counselors and not solely the job seeker. So when we suggest designing for intermediaries more broadly to address the challenge of limited digital literacy among our, our targeted job seekers. So career counselors having access to such tools is also a way to put job seekers in touch with providers who could connect them to resources such as mentors, transportation, education, and potential referrals, thereby supporting social capital in addition to all other employability dimensions. So next I'm going to summarize our findings and conclude the talk. So in summary, we find that job seekers strategies for and barriers to getting ahead include accessing social resources such as getting job search feedback, accessing education and training and transportation. And to an extent, we can we view access to social resources and social capital as one of the most critical barriers and important strategies as this could lead to job search feedback information about where to get resources for education and training, even provide transportation access. We saw how employment tools can address these barriers, but that digital literacy itself was another barrier. And so we contributed for design principles for designers to adhere to, uh, compatibility, practicality, direct support, and familiarity ex and accessibility. And then we also raised the question of external stakeholder perspectives. And we found here that career advisors and business service representatives uh, their key ch challenges and strategies for success included building human capital, but particularly soft skills, translating skills for career identity, and getting job seekers to consider long-term employment and not just short-term, which is related to one's personal adaptability. Finally, as an example of how employment tools can be improved to support all stakeholders, we propose building tools like Dream Gigs, tools that support social and human capital, career identity, and personal adaptability, which are all dimensions of employability. And so I'll say that while social capital and access to social networks is by far a key challenge for our job seekers, transportation is a serious barrier. And I want to call out that we did investigate this further. In fact, this barrier drove our investigation into ways in which transportation could broadly support employment, actually getting to work, job interviews, and accessing career counselors. So in our first study, we onboarded individuals to Uber, and we faced challenges such as digital literacy, similar to those that we faced with our Review Me deployment. But for those individuals who we, who we were able to onboard, we were able to do so successfully from the support from intermediaries such as job training centers and community organizations. And after working through these challenges, we found that real-time ride-sharing systems are an excellent solution for low-resource job seekers. Um, we found in a follow-up study that drivers and passengers were both accessing social resources and building social capital. So some even received job leads. Um, we presented this work at CHI and I encourage you to read it, but I think the key takeaway from all of this and all of our studies is that technology that can connect low-resource job seekers to social capital would support the needs of these populations significantly. And so to conclude, social capital is vital. Leveraging technologies to engage low-resource job seekers in offline contexts is key. And so I'd like to thank you all for, for staying up with me. <laughs> um, uh, thank my research team, uh, National Science Foundation, um, our School of Public Pol Policy, as well as uh, Poverty Solutions. And I'll take you back to the takeaway, so I'll help you prompt, uh, to prompt you for questions. Mm -hmm. I know that was a lot. <laughs> I mean, we, we do um, correspond with our ICTD uh, group. Um, we're still trying to, and we, we, we actually submitted that work <laughs> right along with this, this context, and we were trying to understand uh, the contextual differences, right? I mean, there are, um, you know, and in and, and some cases, there is access, infrastructural access that's available to this population that's not available in ICTD uh, contexts. Um, there are differences in terms of digital literacy. Um, 
I think both might relate to age, right? But but it seems that in ICTD context, the, the connections are these social connections that I've that we're finding in our work that's extremely important are often available in the offline context. So that, so there's still there there are some subtle differences which I think um, won't necessarily in, in, apply in, in our context, but we have uh, look, looked at that literature, we have looked at the literature and shared some of our findings with, with those ICTD researchers. If you have specific instances of, of this work, I would love to hear it in case I've not found that. And a follow-up question, mm -hmm. again, coming from uh, some ICTD and job exploration literature, is mm -hmm. that did you consider using or leveraging social media uh, participation to nudge people into or, or yeah, so going back to the speed dating study, our so, the social media applications that we had for our concepts weren't ranked highly in our context. Um, our job seekers view these social media applications as uh, for professionals. Like they don't uh, they don't identify with with that those types of, of resources, and and so they were ranked very low. Um, I will say that there was a concept that that we that we proposed in which people could come together on a platform and support each other, kind of like, don't give up, like, you know, just really support each other in that way. And that concept was uh, ranked higher uh, because it has to do with building that social capital. But other, other concepts that we suggested were kind of like the, the LinkedIn thing where you can vouch for people. They don't, they didn't want any of that because they knew that they didn't have anyone who could, they didn't feel like they had anyone who could vouch for them. Um, which is why I think uh, having like the volunteer match in the Dream Gigs application so people can meet with people offline and build these connections is, is key. Um, so yeah, we, we have considered social media. Um, I'm, I, I still question though, like uh, in terms of, let's say getting a LinkedIn account because we are starting to talk to employers who do go to LinkedIn to find <laughs> to find people in it and it's like, well, there might be a disadvantage by not having this account. So we've thought about, you know, let's put, let's, let's, let's see what happens if people do get these accounts and connect to intermediaries like uh, those who work at uh, the nonprofit organizations. Because um, we've explored our business school and just what, what's going on in the education system. And the first thing that the business school does is they get the undergrads uh, on social media. <laughs> they, they connect them on LinkedIn. Um, so I think it's a, an issue of perception and, and um, not fitting in there. Uh -huh. So, uh, have you communicated these results to employer stakeholders? Because I was thinking that employer stakeholders might be able to donate resources. Mm -hmm. So, we've definitely communicated these results to the employment centers, but the employers are very hard to reach. So. By talking to the employment centers who, who do have access to the employers, so far that's been the best way to contact them. Um, in Ann Arbor, there's a, a great, uh, Zingerman's, which is a great company, and, and um, their HR representatives have been open to, to talking to us, um, but, but they, they're an outlier. Um, this is a very special uh, company, so we've been able to, to talk to, to them. They don't have, they don't have, resources in terms of helping people. I don't know if this is related to social media, um, but, but the, the unemployment centers, the career centers do have um, workshops where people can go and learn how to, to get on these sessions. But again, this is a matter of perception. If the job seekers don't feel like they, that, that this is their platform or a platform that speaks to them, that they're unlikely to, they, they just don't sign up. I mean, I was just thinking that if, if the employer stakeholders understood mm -hmm. what these barriers were, that they might be able to help come up oh, with Oh, I see. I right? see. I see. Yeah, I mean, we, we've, again, spoken to the organizations, the unemployment organizations, the career counselors, but we haven't been able to reach uh, the, employ, the employers. Um, because, you know, transportation, again, we believe this is something that an employer could provide. Um, some have, but not all of them do. They, 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 I mean, I think, I think some employers do understand, um, but then we've seen where employers fire people who are late more than three times, and so it's like, do they really? You know, because the bus, if they miss the bus, even if they try early, if the bus doesn't come, they're gonna, 
yeah, they're yeah, they're they're not gonna make it. And I've I've we've spoken to uh, grocery stores in who were looking at transportation solutions, and um, some of the grocery stores told us that yeah, people just stop coming. Like they've been late twice, and they just stop coming after that because of other employers who fire after the three times, and so. Yeah, I mean, I think if we could have a convention of employers to present the results, it would be great. Um, but for now, is you know, we've had a very hard time reaching out to them. It's been the employment centers who we've provided this work to. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk. It was a lot of uh, really interesting work. Can you talk some more about intermediaries? And so, in your thinking. Um, when you talk about intermediaries, are you only talking about public and sort of like civic sector workers? And then are you also thinking of like LinkedIn as an intermediary? Yeah, that's a, a great question. We're thinking about these career centers as intermediaries, you know, platforms to, or places where people can go face to face. Um, I've not thought about LinkedIn. As, I mean, I, again, I, it's hard as a researcher because, you know, the, the what we're getting from the population <coughs> is that LinkedIn is not the place um, but then to look at different you know look think about the business school who they're bringing the students on to LinkedIn as soon as they, they get on it's like wait what would happen and so part of me wants to like just hey you know let's see if there's a, a you know a benefit here um, but then it's like this isn't what we've gotten from the, the population so I mean this is a conversation we've had with the career centers and they say well we have these workshops for people to, to come on, but they, they haven't attended. So maybe it's more of a conversation we need to have with everyone and say, let's, let's see what LinkedIn can, can do. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> thanks again for your talk. Um, uh, so in the design of dream gigs, I thought it was really interesting because it, it, um, <clears throat> it seeks to align sort of short term interest in getting a job with longer term interest of career development. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about any, any designs, any sort of design decisions you made to sort of support the alignment of the short term and long term objectives? Yeah, I mean, short term and long term, I have to think about that. Because um, the work we presented at Kai really goes into the design decisions that were made. And so we, we spoke with, we had uh, social workers who looked at the initial concepts and we, 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 were, we, did, we were pulling from Craigslist because Craigslist, they do have gigs, right? <laughs> Which are you know inherently short term. Yeah. And the social worker said, no, we, we can't, like Craigslist, like they're looking for people to take tests for them. We were getting really crazy results. And so we removed that and they suggested, you know, indeed for, I guess, more reliable jobs. They, it still doesn't guarantee a longer term job, but I guess they are perceived as more secure. And then the, um, the, the social workers also mention opportunities for volunteering. This is coming from the job seekers and the, and the social workers. And I think, I mean, I, again, I can't speak to the long-term nature, but I can speak to the opportunities that volunteering would, would provide in terms of making these, these contacts. So I guess to answer your question, maybe these volunteer organizations are also intermediaries in terms of you know getting the social capital or making the connections that are often needed in order to you know, get people in the, in the door. Um, but long-term jobs, you know, so the employment centers have told us that job seekers should think about work as a long-term thing. Like, most people just want to get a job. You get a job, but a month later, they might not have the job anymore. And, and they'll get the job, and they won't contact this employment center anymore. They're, they're, and that's a problem the employment center has. They need to maintain contact with the job seekers so that they can keep, you know, they can keep track of, of the progress and they can demonstrate to the state that they're doing their jobs. And so the, and the, the career centers, they want people to think about this as being a long-term journey, right? I have to maintain, I have to continue to be, you know, gain training so that I can move to the next job, so that I can move to the next, so that I can find a, a stable career. So from, from, this is what we're getting from the career center. It isn't what we got in the design of the, the tool, um, but, but I think the tool in a way kind of, you know, forces you to, to, yeah. to think like this is a stepping stone to, to go to next so that I can get to, you know, my, my dream, my dream game. Yeah, that was what seemed really great about it is yeah. that it does, 
you know, it, it sort of bridges the gap from I want to be a nurse yeah. versus I don't know what to do next. Right, <clears throat> right. Or, you know, it, it was beneficial in our cases. A lot of the manufacturing plants closed down, and mm -hmm. so they're not sure what the crossover skills. They don't know what, their current, what they can do with their current skills. And, and this tool actually opens up opportunities that they just didn't. You know, they, in some cases, I don't even think of it's like, yeah. oh. <laughs> I think, it, again, a lot of these tools could support any, anyone in, the, in their job search, not just these populations. Yeah. Yeah. Stacey, yeah, we have time for, time for, I guess, two oh, more? Is that? Okay, okay cool. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work. I love that you're working with multiple stakeholders and really deeply engaging with the community. It's so important. Um, and I think when you were talking about social capital, you mostly were discussing how job seekers were connecting to intermediaries and they're connecting to the employers. But I was wondering if job seekers have social networks and whether those bring about value and you see an important potential for intervention there. Yeah, I mean, that's a, another uh, great question. Um, so we, we asked job seekers, um, you know, like who they get feedback from. Because they talked about the need to get feedback on like resumes or not knowing mm -hmm. why they didn't get the job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they would say, well, they had the same problem that I did, like in the current networks. Mm -hmm. um, and they would also speak to reaching, to finding people who are in the positions that they want to, to be. Mm -hmm. So the nature of it was, they, they you know, on one side I, I saw where people felt the need to, to go outside of their networks. But I think the benefit of the internal networks was support. You know, like, oh, you know, you're gonna, you know, we're gonna get through. You know, we, you know, are having the community centers to provide that that type of like maybe emotional support. Mm -hmm. But in terms of moving to the next stage, a lot of people in the networks were in the same. They were going through the same mm -hmm. things. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so really interesting work. Thanks for the talk. Um, do you have any advice on how we might approach designing with training for digital literacy as the explicit goal rather than as kind of an intermediary for job seekers? Like if you were yeah. to you know, approach uh, one of these volunteer community organizations who had that as an explicit goal and, and you know, here are all the other things that it can facilitate. Yeah, so, um, so one thing that, that my uh, team does, uh, the, one of the organizations that we partnered with asked us if we could uh, facilitate their BYOD, which is bring your own device days. And so the community members come in and they just bring whatever device they want to bring to learn, you know, how do, I, how do I unfriend this person on Facebook? Or how do I Skype with my granddaughter? How do I do these things? And so we've been keeping track of the types of questions that come out of the BYOD sessions. And I had a student, you know, analyze this data and, and what, it seems, what seems to come out of the data is the need for a physical, like the, so the, the problem I think with technology, and this goes back to the, the Uber and Lyft, is that um, people don't want to engage with technologies that they can't see. Like, where is Uber located? Right? That's a question that I got. They say, look, I know where this taxi cab stand is. It's a physical entity. If something happens, I can come here and I can you know, do something about it. But this Uber and Lyft, if, if there's a problem, I have to email them to, to get in you know, contact. Um, and then this notion of like emailing, you know, emailing myself my resume to, to keep it. Like, there's something in something um, that's like non tangible about how like where technology is going that uh, we we find in these BYOD sessions. It's not really translating well. And and we've asked in other sessions, you know, how would you define technology? And and usually the the, the responses are types of technologies, but are they're tangible? They're like Roku boxes or like you know physical thing robots. Right, and, and, and I think that has something to, to do with it. So I always give the example of we're gonna, you know, um, add things to the cloud. Like maybe we need to have a physical, like cloud device. I mean, that's really a USB stick, right? But if, if that's how you like, you know, speak to it, this is this is the day. This is it. Um, we, we think that you know maybe there's something there um, because I feel like as technologists, we're we're you know things are invisible. Like we, it's just hidden. Um, so I, I mean I don't know if that answers your question, um, but but I, I, this is something that we've thought about and we're working on concepts to, to actually see if they you know if, if, if they make sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Please join me in uh, thanking Professor Joseph.